And um, what's the outline? The outline is that we're going to skip chapter 1. Um, the Chrysic test text at least we're not going to go through it <coughs> um, line, line by line we're going to pick up as we've gone along now how many people have not had 532 math 532 Which one is that? math 532 modern analysis 2 how many people have not had that well that makes nobody not having it, okay? <laughs> because I know the other two people have had it, and chapter one is all covered in Math 532. So that's why we're going to skip it. Um, we'll be covering it quite a bit as we go along in chapter two anyway. I'm just going to recall the results from chapter one. as we go along. Okay. And the core is chapters 2, 3, 4. There are some applications as we go along and then uh, I'm hoping to, I was hoping to do some spectral theory at the end. And <laughs> depending on how it goes, we, we may go faster than I thought or maybe we go slower than I thought, but um, <coughs> There are some applications in chapters 5 and 6, and everybody says that right off the bell, well, of course, let's do those. But chapter 5 was the fixed point theorem that you all had in 532 anyway. Math 532, which is the modern analysis, too. And uh, I thought we'd just go on a little bit of special theory. It'd be nice to have a two-semester course and do the whole book. But it's... Uh, other questions there? What about the syllabus? I've, I've, I have written it out that um, the homework would be worth 50 percent then we have two tests I think I'll make the test take home uh, though I'll consider other possibilities if, if you want to have an in-class test but since this is a pure graduate course uh, you have to have special permission to be an undergraduate to take the course I think it's reasonable to have the homework count for the most there won't be any supplemental instructor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. So, chapter two starts with vector space. And I know all of you have had a course in, that defines a vector space. So I'm going to, there are something like 10 axioms to a vector space. But we all understand that most of those axioms are kind of automatic in our brains. But what you have is, you, we'll call the, the space capital X, and then we'll have elements X and uh, Y vectors in X. And then we'll have a, a scale, field of scalars, which in this course will, course will always be R, the real line, or the complex numbers. So there's not going to be any complicated field of scalars. And it will be clear in the context which field we're using in any given problem. So what are the basic properties, uh, some of the basic things you can do? You know that uh, you can add. So x plus y will belong to x. That's property one, <laughs> okay? So addition. You can add the vectors and stay in the vector space. What else can you do? You can scale and multiply. I'm going to call my tip, my, the notation is a lot of what's going on here in these first lectures. Alpha is going to be the author's notation for a scalar. So what we'll have is that alpha x is in the space. Okay, scalar multiplication. 
By the way, pipe in anytime you want. This is just a test of the new system. That's why I'm being real careful with my words. Usually I babble on and on and on, and I'm trying to control myself a little bit. Uh, partially because I'm nervous, but other than that, uh, this is how it is. So then, what are, what are some of the distributive laws? So just make sure everybody knows that we have these, and then we'll go on to the examples. You can, you can distribute a scalar multiplication, alpha times x plus y equals alpha x plus alpha y. And of course, you also have um, alpha plus beta, add two scalars times x equals times x equals alpha x plus beta x, that type of thing. Addition is commutative, x plus y equals y plus x. It's associative, x plus y plus z equals to x plus y plus z, etc. Okay, etc. So that's a vector space. Any comments or questions about that? What are the basic examples? And our notation for them. Examples will be Euclidean space, Rn, which will be denoted this way. X is going to be a vector, and Rn is just going to be a, an n-tuple, C1. Now, you're going to have to learn how to do Cs if you haven't learned so already, and I'm going to have a hard time here, too. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's try that. That, that last one looks okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> He's an analyst. <laughs> Use C's and etas. Okay, uh -huh. so on the typewriter, it's C, and then there's an eta, which is its. So this corresponds to X's and Y's. All right, those are going to be the core. So because he doesn't want to use boldface or those type of things for his vectors, he uses just plain old little old x, so that's easier, that's easier to write. Then when he needs to get detailed, he'll write the coordinates as c or eta occasionally. Sorry. The, scalar, the scalars are always alpha, beta, gamma. And he uses a higher in the alphabet for the... Uh, coordinates of the of the Greek alphabet for the coordinates of the, the vectors when I need to coordinateize. <clears throat> so there it is. And so you obviously scalar multiplication alpha in R then gives alpha x is equal to alpha c1 down to uh, alpha xn. Now also in the, de in the axioms of the vector space you have a zero vector there's always a zero vector. The zero vector, which sometimes I'll put a bar over to indicate that it's the zero vector, or sometimes in the beginning of the course, theta for a zero, the zero vector. And that's, of course, here. It's equal to zero, zero, and so on up to zero. All right? There's a zero vector you added to anything, you get back the original. Also, there's an additive inverse. There's a minus x for an x. And that's the same thing as a scalar minus 1 times x. Uh, that can be proved from the axioms. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I think we'll go on from there. And then also, there's the, uh, he calls it unitary space. Whoops. Uh, the complex uh, numbers, n tuples of complex numbers, which is exactly the same notation. Only now the Xs uh, here the Xs were in uh, Ci were belonging to the real line. Those were real numbers. Here the Ci are in the complex numbers. And the scalars are also in the complex numbers. That's the only difference. So it's um, n-tuples of numbers. Are questions about that? Or? Uh, so I have, again, uh, x equals c1. It's the same exact notation. Right. 
So that's just a comment. There's a different, the different scalar field. So either the scalar field is R, and then we have Rn, or the scalar field is C, and you have Cn. Now, is Rn a subspace of Cn? What's a subspace? Maybe we should go on to that. Let's see. Oh, maybe I'll mention one thing before we go on to subspace. I'll, I'll just go ahead and follow my notes. So here we have sequence space. Sequence space. He mentions this. If you look, and he just denotes it by a little s. Uh, what you'll do, you could consider it, uh, it's, just, it's just infinite sequences. So you can add those, just like you can add n tuples. Uh, if I take y to be a to 1, a to 2, I didn't show how to add before. But here, obviously, I can add by adding coordinate-wise. So you'll have fun making squiggles. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty, pretty hard to learn. It's like making integral signs. You go home for five or ten minutes and you try it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so infinite sequence, and these could either be this could either be the, uh, the real sequences, and then use the scalar field to be the real numbers, or they could be complex sequences. It won't make much difference in application. Um, well in terms of the formalism. Okay. Again, zero would be equal to a sequence of all zeros and so on. All right. So that's another vector space. What's a subspace? Subspace Y of a vector space x. All right. What's a subspace? Anyone? It's a, sort of a vector space contained in another one. And so, I mean, I can give you the, the theorem. Probably easier than the precise definition. OK. Determining whether it's a subspace. Good. Yeah, it is a subspace in its own right. It, has, it just uses the same scalar multiplication and addition is the original vector space. So no new operations. The main property would be, have to be that if I add two elements from this subset, then the sum would still be in the subset. And if I did scalar multiple from that subset, then it would have to again belong to the subset. So it must contain all possible uh, new vectors that we can uh, generate by doing addition and scalar multiplication. So one of the definitions, and, and this is the characterization of the subspace, uh, so y in x is a subspace if and only if um, for every, um, oops, sorry about that, if and only if alpha 1, this is succinctly, alpha 1 y1 plus alpha 2 y2 belongs to y for every uh, scalars, alpha 1, alpha 2 scalars, and for all y1 and y2 belonging to y. So in particular, if I take uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2 both equal to 1, then the sum is back in. And if I take alpha 1, arbitrary and alpha 2, 0, then a scalar multiple of an element is back in the space. Okay. Um, so maybe we should have a counterexample to make sure we know something that's not subspace. Uh, subspace. Um, so let's consider um, consider the set of all 
uh, pairs C1, C2 in good old R2 Euclidean space such that C2 is greater than or equal to zero. Is this a subspace? Getting a little skippage here, subspace. of R2. What would it be geometrically? What is the set geometrically? Okay, that would be the first coordinate greater than equal to zero. This is this oh, yeah. this is x comma y, yeah. y greater than or equal to zero. You have to translate <laughs> a little bit, right? So that's the upper half plane, including the x-axis. So that's geometrically, if this is the c1 axis, this is the c2 axis, then this is the upper half plane. Is that a subspace? Certainly, it's a nice subset. Why is it not a subspace? I heard I saw some people not uh, giving me the nay sign. Uh, it's not closed actually under either the, the scalar multiplication or the addition. If I, if I were to multiply um, just any ordered pair from the upper half plane by negative one, I get a point that's going to be in the lower half. Plane. Okay. So if you take a vector here and you multiply by minus one, this is x, and here's minus x. Minus x not in whatever I call this. I call this h for uh, for a half plane. Play with the pen a little bit here. H equals this. All right. Then here's minus x is not in h. Okay. So it's not. In particular, the whole line generated by x would have to belong to the space if it were a subspace, right? So you, you get that kind of a, the, the business. OK. The answer is no. All right, now let's go on. How about, this is, this is a little bit of an, an interesting, I'm gonna use as many pages, does it matter how many pages I use? Not for you all. <laughs> if somebody was trying to print it, they might care. <laughs> um, maybe I'll, I can go save a little bit of space here. Um, let's consider a subspace of sequence space. Consider S naught equals subspace of sequence space. So sequence space is just all infinite sequences. Uh, consisting of sequences that have only finitely many non-zero terms. That's a mouthful. Uh, terms in the sequence. Why, uh, can anybody explain uh, using that characterization of subspace why that would be actually a subspace? Well, I mean, if you add two sequences with only a finite number of non-zero terms that you'll still have a finite number of non-zero terms. Only a finite number? Yeah. Because you could at most use up 10 yeah, so slots yeah. and then another 10 slots, yeah. let's say, or another 100 slots. But anyway, there would still yeah. only be finite plus finite is finite. Good. And then the scale and multiplication for the same reason because you're going to be hitting a bunch of zeros eventually and then it's not uh -huh. going to change. Right, so the alpha times zero is zero. And so the number of non-zero terms is exactly the same 
uh, upon scalar multiplication as long as the scalar is not the zero scalar. <laughs> so that's a subspace. Now, we, this would break down if we tried to, say, like, give specific numbers to the amounts of non-zero terms, right? You couldn't say something like a, a sequence space of all the sequences with only 15 non-zero terms. Well, I don't know. Yeah, because then if you add them, right. you're not getting Right, out of right. That doesn't work. You could say the first 15. Yeah, something like that. That's okay, but just to say 15, period. No good. Right. Very good. Good thinking. All right, that's a sequence space and a subspace, which is going to come in handy later for counterexamples, perhaps, <laughs> i.e. your homework. <laughs> Let's see. Um, what's another subspace of sequence space? Here's another one. L infinity, all bounded sequences. Now, I don't know if everybody remembers what that means, all bounded sequences. So again, I'm taking C1, C2, dot, 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 dot. All right, X is that. And what I'm going to say is that it's bounded, the sequence is bounded. What does that mean? Do you remember? There exists um, like an M. There exists some M such that the absolute value of so that C so that CJ is less than or equal to M for every J. <laughs> You can read it, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. We better fix it. Okay, that is correct. <laughs> this perfection doesn't uh, suit me. <laughs> I used a little m because later he's going to use capital M as a subspace, so I'm using a little m here. Um, that's correct. That's what a bounded sequence is. And here, clearly, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about real or complex numbers, because absolute value goes for both of them. So we'll only differentiate if it's absolutely necessary. <clears throat> and what we can actually define is something we can actually ta talk about the smallest m that could be used in this definition. Uh, so I should put greater than or equal to zero in case m equal to zero would be possible. What's the smallest m that would work? The norm, so-called norm of x, and this will be a so-called infinity norm. In other words, there's actually um, different norms possible, but this is one, is equal to, defined to be equal to the supremum of these absolute values exceed j, j belonging to the natural numbers. So it's the smallest m that we could possibly take. We know from our modern analysis course that uh, essential axiom of the real numbers is that this supremum exists as long as there is a bound m at least if there is at least one bound m then there is a least upper bound okay so that's the definition now um, so we can say it's all sequences whose norm is finite all right so if I re rewrite that, L infinity equals all infinite sequences with 
what had happened. Got the thing to turn off. Here we go. X, so that the infinity norm of X is finite. <laughs> that's two infinities, but that's just the way it goes. That's, that's, uh, now, it's a vector space, or is it? Is that a vector space? Because I've, I'm not taking all sequences now. Again, I'm, I'm talking. I must be talking about a subset. Because certainly, I can take a sequence that is unbounded. All right? There are plenty of sequences that are unbounded, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. That's an unbounded sequence, which wouldn't belong. Which wouldn't belong to this space. So is this a vector space? Why? I would think so. Um, if you have two bounded sequences and you add them up at the most, the, the bound could twist much. Yeah, it would be the sum of the bounds at most. OK. So indeed, what you actually have is that, uh, what you have, in fact, is that the norm of x plus y turns out to be the sum of the norms. fact, 1, and then of course 2, fact 2 would be, um, if I take a scalar multiple of x and I take its infinity norm, then I actually get the absolute value of alpha times the infinity norm of x. Okay, so if the norm of x is finite and the norm of y is finite, then the sum of the norms is finite, so that, therefore the norm of x plus y is finite. So that means the sum belongs to the space. And of course, uh, finite times finite is finite. So it would not be required, perhaps, to write these inequalities as explicitly we, as we have. We can use some other arguments as Matt was doing, just basically saying the sum of any two bounds will work. All right, these are the sum of the smallest bounds. Okay, so yes, it is a vector subspace, therefore, of the sequence space. In fact, it's, uh, it turns out to be a normed space. We get into uh, another definition. Uh, a normed space, space is a vector space with a norm defined on it. Now there are a number of properties of norm. These are two of them, but there are two others. The two others are that the norm should be non-negative. That may be kind of implicit in our minds, just the way we denoted it. And the, th and the last one is that the norm, okay, so norm should also be greater than or equal to zero, and so I won't put the infinity norm in general, but uh, I did here because of the, in, because of the uh, definition. Um, and you'll see why infinity if you read it into chapter one just a little bit. Uh, I'll give you a hint about that later. Um, and the other one is that x, well, of course, the norm of 0 should equal to 0. And also, norm of x equal to 0 implies that x is the 0 vector. So those are the other ones that I need. And these here. Boy, it's starting to get messy. But you can look in the book. So, okay.
Okay. It's challenging my organization skills here. <laughs> so this is an uh, this is an and sign. And. And. <laughs> If the, is it true, if the norm is equal to zero, does that mean I have the zero vector in this case? If the norm is zero, that means the supremum is zero. That means all the CJs must be zero, right? So that's one time, sometimes it's a little tricky to check that particular one. The norm of the zero vector must be zero. I could put the theta here if you want to, to the, Theta, that means the zero vector, the, the zero sequence, zero, 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 zero. And that's the only one whose norm is zero, is the point. The one and only one whose norm is zero must, is the zero vector. That's what that last axiom states. So there are four axioms for a norm. It should be non negative. The one and only one vector whose norm is zero is the zero vector, uh, the scalar multiplication rule and the so-called triangle inequality is number one here. Okay. All right. So that's your L infinity. Uh, how do you how do you verify the triangle inequality for this case? How, what would be a formal proof, whoops, of that? I would take, I need to take uh, x equal to c1, c2, and so on. And then let's say y equal to eta1, eta2, and so on. And then x plus y is equal to c1 plus eta1, c2 plus eta2, and so on. Then I need to compute the infinity norm of x plus y. That's the supremum over all j belonging to the natural numbers of the absolute value of cj plus eta j. So this is, then what would I do? I want to try to get that triangle inequality I had in the previous sheet, which was right here, number one. I want to get number one. How can I do that here? Well, you, can you just say from here that this, that supremum is less than or equal to the supremum of the, uh, the eta, is it, or no, C? C. And then plus the supremum of the other one? Yeah. But you usually you need to make some kind of yeah, like why, fill in. Why does that work? Yeah, for, fill in the argument. Okay. So so yeah, we know that it's going to work. But how can we do that? What can we use? Can we use some other kind of triangle? I mean, don't we have a triangle yeah, inequality? Real the real number triangle inequality. Very good. Yeah. We know that that I can find an, uh, a number bigger than C J plus A to J in absolute value by taking the sum of the absolute values. So I certainly have by the triangle inequality for the real numbers. this business, right? Now I would say the soup of a sum is at most the sum of the soups. That has to be worked out in general. But you can think of it this way. Um, You can think of the soup of the sum as being nearly attained at some index j naught. In other words, you're very close to the actual soup at, at some index j naught. That index j naught may be, have to be very large, for example, if you were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger numbers. But as long as there is a bound, and there is, okay, because that was already the argument before by Matt saying, well, if I have 
two bounds, and that clearly is going to work. It's only a question of whether I can put the smallest two bounds in, and I guess that's kind of obvious, but <laughs> we're doing it here anyway. So basically, if you think of it, the way to think about it, I think, at least I think the way to think about it is, think about the soup being nearly attained at some index j naught. Okay. Now, that's for the sum. But now, if I if I take c of j naught alone, they may or may not be close to the soup of the c's. And if I take eta of j naught alone, that may be or may not be that close to this the soup of the eta j's, okay? So they may be quite a bit smaller, actually. One of them could be, all right? Not both of them could be, <laughs> okay? But anyway, one of them could be. So this would be less than or equal to the sum of the soups. That's a general rule you may now use without proof, okay? The soup of a sum of, abs of positive numbers is less than or equal to the sum of the soups. Do I need more explanation on that? Okay. Which is equal to x infinity plus y infinity. Okay. All right, what's another possible subspace of that sequence space? What if we take a different norm? Isn't it, it can I take a different norm? Can you think of another thing I might do instead of taking the, the supremum? How about if I take the sum of absolute values? Does that sound good? That might work also. So L1, okay, all sequences, C1, C2, etc., with the infinite series of absolute values. as a finite number. And I'll call that the L1 norm, the little L1. This is because uh, later we're going to have a big L1. So this the little L, that's the, I script the L. It's called little L1. With this norm, that's going to be a norm. Let's check a couple things. Uh, well, I think that obviously uh, by our knowledge of infinite, a little knowledge of infinite series that if I take a sum of vectors as I did before, and I take the sum of the and I take the sum of the absolute values here, that again using the triangle inequality, just have a sum here instead of a soup, and that that will be convergent because both of the individual uh, sums are convergent. So I'll have a convergent sum, and so I'll get the triangle inequality estimate. Um, scalar multiplication is fairly obvious. So there's a certain homogeneity in this norm. So the alpha has to scale out with an absolute value to the first power alpha. If I multiply the, the sequence by alpha and take the norm, then the absolute value of alpha has to scale out with an equality. That's obvious. So the scalar multiplication rule and the triangle inequality both hold now. Obviously, it's a non-negative quantity. And also, if, uh, if I take the zero vector, obviously, its norm is zero. And can anything other than the zero vector have norm zero? Obviously not, because if at least one c is not zero, then the norm is not zero. So that's another one. <laughs> okay. So maybe the same set of vectors, but two different norms, two different normed spaces. All right. All right, what's some other familiar stuff? What about, uh, okay, I want to get on from here. One more example, the continuous functions on a closed interval. So I'm going to have x equals x of t, a less or equal to t less or equal to b. It's going to be my, my, my vector is going to be 
a function. And obviously you can add two functions. X plus Y is at T. equals x of t plus y of t. So if you think about it, it's, a lot, it's, just, it's a lot like sequence space, only now there's a continuum of indices, t ranging in the uh, continuous interval a to b rather than j going from 1 to infinity. So it's very, very similar algebra, you know, from that vector space situation as sequence space from just a vector space point of view. And then alpha x at t is just simply alpha times x of t. Right. So that's the addition of scalar multiplication. Um, and what would be, a, what, what's one of the classical norms on this one? Integrals. Okay, that's one of them. Integral of the absolute value. That's one of them. There's two, two natural ones. One of them would be, again, the, the uh, soup norm. Again, I could put the infinity on here, but I'm just, I'm going to get, I know that infinity kind of was getting all over the place on the page, so I'm going to skip it here. <laughs> uh, this is equal to um, the maximum of the absolute value of x of t. And that actually exists by the extreme value of theorem. So we could call it the supremum, but here actually we have something nicer because as a continuous function, we actually have that the maximum exists. There is a t naught. So that x of t naught in absolute value is the largest possible absolute value. And then we could also have, and that's going to be a norm just like we checked with the, uh, well actually you have to check it yourself in your homework. <laughs> so that one of the homework problems is to check that it is a norm. I hope that's not too bad. Now another one is um, as uh, Travis was saying. Oh, yeah, I don't know. There's, I've seen different types of integral. Um, okay, let's have this one. x1 equals integral a to b. Yeah, Joyce knows another one. <laughs> Here, absolute value of x of t dt. This one's a little hard to check one of the uh, axioms on. What's the, what's the one that's hard to check from an ana an analysis point of view? This is the L1 norm. This is the big L1 now. <coughs> oh, wow, the edge of the page is over there. OK. Can you read that big L? It's the big L. OK? That, the one that's hard to check there is that the zero vector and only the zero vector has norm zero. You have to show that if the norm is zero, then x must be the zero vector. It's kind of intuitively obvious, because how can a continuous function have integral zero if it's not the zero function? Uh, excuse me, how can a non-negative continuous function have integral zero unless it's a zero function? And it can't. But you have to check that. OK, there's another one, L2 norm. In order to get homogeneity, not only do I take this, so if I, if I take the square of the function, then I have to take a square root to get the absolute value of alpha coming out in the scaling rule. And then, of course, you have to check the triangle inequality, and that's a little bit harder. The ones I've been checking so far have been re reasonably easy. 
to check the triangle inequality. Here you have to do a little bit more work. And that's done in chapter one. But, and we'll go, go back there as we need to, to check the triangle inequality here. Okay. So there's, there's a couple more norm space. Okay, let's go on. What We need to review a little bit of the theory of vector spaces, namely linear independence and basis, and therefore dimension of a vector space. So linearly independent set. So let x be a vector space. We'll come back to norm spaces um, in the uh, day after tomorrow in the next lecture, lecture two. Okay. But I think for the rest of today we're going to pretty much finish with vector spaces and talk about any linear independence. So x1, x2, so I'm going to take n vectors uh, subset of x is called a linearly independent set of vectors under what conditions? What's the definition? It's, it's basically that any given vector from the set is not a linear combination of the remaining vectors. Okay, did everyone hear that? Any given vector in the set is not a linear combination of the others. That is actually a good definition. And we can use that. However, I'm also going to give another technical definition which is equivalent to it. Which is also very useful. Because it's easy to just to check this condition in certain proofs. Okay. So, so I'll write both of these down. So the first definition I'm going to give is that um, if the following condition holds, if the following condition holds, alpha 1 x 1 plus dot 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 plus alpha r I put x, x I put x n here, so I better put x n. x n equal to the zero vector. I just put theta here because we used it. <laughs> okay. Uh, imply for some scalars alpha one through alpha n implies that alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals and so on equals alpha n equal the zero scalar. So the only way that a linear combination of these vectors can be the zero vector is if all, all of the scalars are zero, which clearly then does give you the zero vector. That's the definition of linear independence. Okay, so what's the other one? The equivalent to the statement S so this is linearly independent set is one definition and equivalent to statement S which is no one of the vectors may be written as a linear combination of the others.
Here's where I needed the hyphen. <laughs> oh well, this is the word combination. Can you read it? Here you can. Okay. <laughs> And uh, the proof which I put in those notes, I said those type notes, is the proof is equivalence. Equivalence is not linearly independent if and only if not S. Okay? So if not linearly independent, then there's some at least one alpha that's not zero in the original equation. If, if not linearly independent, then there's at least one alpha that's not zero here. But still, you get the zero vector. Then you can divide by that alpha. Let's say alpha one was not zero. You divide by the alpha one and write x one as a linear combination of the other vectors. Okay, so therefore not s. Because s said, that couldn't be done, all right? So not, it implies not S. And then also not S, if no one of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of the others, so I mean, if one of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of the others, then trivially you could write down an equation here where all the alphas are not zero. Okay, so you would get not linearly independent. So I won't, go, I won't say more than that. You can read the notes if you want a little bit more detail. Detail. Okay, so those are well known from your linear algebra, first course in linear algebra. The rest of this is going to be pretty much well known, except what are we going to do about infinite dimensional vector spaces? A subset M in X is called linearly dependent if it is not linearly independent. <laughs> but I have to talk about infinite sets where if M is infinite, okay, then M is linearly independent if each finite subset is linearly independent. Okay, what's an example of an infinite set of linearly independent vectors for some vector space that we talked about today? Take an easy example, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want an infinite. I want, um, that's, that's um, well, line in R2, okay, uh, we'll only generate one vector. I, um, I can't, in other words, M, I want a linearly independent vector because a line is generated by one vector. So if I take two vectors, if I take two linearly independent vectors, it's automatically going to give me a plane. But, okay. When I take the, the span, the linear combinations of those two. So uh, what I'm looking for is a vector space which is infinite dimensional so that I have whatever that means. <laughs> but that, what it means for right now is just means that I could have an infinite linearly independent set. That's going to be our definition of uh, infinite dimensional vector space. There exists an infinite linearly independent set. Is that the polynomials? Okay, you can take the polynomials. That will work. Yeah. Okay. Example. Um, set of all polynomials, uh, say Z equals all polynomials on, let's say, the unit interval. That's a vector space. If I add two polynomials, I get a polynomial. 
scalar multiple, we'll just say the real polynomials, for example, just to keep it explicit, <laughs> okay? Um, then, uh, 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 let's see, linearly independent set would probably be 1, t, t squared, t cubed, etc. This should be m equals this is linearly independent. How would you check that? This is linearly independent. Okay, so you need to take any finite set, let's just take the first n of them and show they're, they're linearly independent, right? So any finite subset, obviously that's going to do. So I'll just take the first n, or n plus 1, that'll give me 1 through t to the n. Show that those are linearly independent, that's all you need to do by this definition. If every finite subset, and that's going to cover all the finite subsets then. That I need to because... Right. Any finite subset will be eventually contained in one of those. So I need to show, it'll be suffice to show that, uh, that 1 t, t squared, t cubed up through t to the n are literally independent. How do you do that? I mean, this is actually, a, you know, it's a bit of a mind racker if you think about it. How do I prove that the only way I can get the zero function, which is the zero is going to be the zero function, all right? The zero polynomial. How do I show that the only way to get the zero polynomial, somehow, in other words, the t squared can't cancel out the t, right? How do you prove that? It's an algebra proof, isn't it? Fundamental Okay, we could use some fundamental theorems. I'm thinking of just uh, use a little calculus. The derivative would be allowed. <laughs> Let the derivative be allowed. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> Let the derivative be allowed. Suppose that, suppose, Um, a zero times, I'll use A's, as well, I could use alpha. Alpha zero <laughs> times one plus alpha one times t plus alpha two times t squared plus and so on plus alpha to the alpha n t to the n is identically equal to zero. So three equal signs to make identically equal to zero. What could I do to make, to show that the alphas are all zero? Yeah. Let's take the uh, n derivatives. Then I go show uh, n factorial alpha n equals to zero by n derivatives. Etc. Okay? So I show that alpha n is equal to zero and then by an induction proof show alpha n minus one is equal to zero by after plugging back in and so on. So that would be one way to do it. You could do differences, right? If you want to take the limit of differences, <laughs> difference quotients, it's easier. And so you have to somehow use the fact that uh, if you had um, enough points, if you had polynomials only on a finite set, you'd have trouble here. All polynomials on a finite set. No, it has to be uh, at least an infinite set, okay? And here we took the continuum 0, 1, so that kind of <laughs> covers all the bases. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. That's linear independence. Uh, have a few more minutes. What's uh, the span? If I have if if M is a subset of a vector space X, X is a vector space. The span of M equals a set of all linear combinations, finite linear combinations. I'll put alpha m, x m, uh, alpha 1 through alpha m scalar. want to confuse anybody. Those are scalars. <laughs> Still can't read it. Um, 
x1 through xm belong to m and m is any integer. m is in some in the natural numbers. So it's all possible finite linear combinations generated. That itself is a vector space generated by m, so-called. This is a vector subspace. So x is a vector space. This is span m is a vector space, is a subspace. Okay. And, uh, well, that's kind of easy to verify. Again, you could just take the linear combination of two things. And that would be a linear combination. That would be, again, one of these things. Okay, you'd have to take a bigger little m, all right, if you had two disjoint groups of x's, right, for the two different elements y that you're going to consider. You're going to consider one y1 and another y2. And the y1 is some linear combination from certain x's. Another y2 is a linear combination from other x's. Now take the linear combination of the whole thing. You have to join the sets of x's to get a bigger set of x, but that's still allowed here. Okay, the x's are not fixed here. x1 through xm are just any m vector. So it's all uh, finite linear combinations generated. Okay. Okay, so that's something. Now what is, so okay, so there's some very simple things, right? What's the span of the set 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0 um, in R3? Okay, so the, the super vector space is R3, and I take two vectors, that's my M, then this is my M. It consists of two elements, what's the span of M? I think I can get this. <laughs> <laughs> the XY plane? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or C1, C2 yeah, plane. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's an easy example. All right. Um, so, what is now. Um, dimension and what's basis? Those are the last two things that we need from vector space theory. Is that enough time? We can even this, this one. This is my M in this case. All right. This one. This is my M in this case. Um, dimension. <coughs> Size, cardinality wise. Of the smallest set, again, smallest in terms of number, set M in X that generates all of X. Okay, so either there is a, okay, we'll look at it this way. Either there is a finite set that generate, a finite set of elements of X that generates all of X. There isn't. There isn't. So either the dimension is finite or infinite. That's a pretty simple dichotomy. Either there is a finite set that generates the whole thing or not. If there is a finite set, then I take the, small, the size of the uh, smallest possible generating set, cardinality-wise. That will be called a dimension. Now, it turns out that if the dimension is finite in that way, then the dimension is unique. 
That's a theorem from linear algebra. So let's put it this way. Either there exists a finite set M with span M equals X or not. That's the first, that's the basic dichotomy. If, if there is one, then dimension is finite, else infinite. That's pretty clear from that definition alone. Now, um, what's the thing that I really want to get? What I intuitively, what should we have about a smallest possible set? I mean, if I could define it as such a smallest possible set, would be linearly independent. Why? Redundant, so right. Redundant. You can take one out. Yeah. You can take one must be a linear combination of the others. If it's not linearly independent by that property that we discussed earlier, so you could throw it out. So you just keep doing that. Now the only trick is whether you you know have to do it infinitely many times <laughs> in the infinite dimensional case, and then you start getting into something called Zorn's lemma, where you uh, allow by axiom of choice or so to do such weird constructions, basically, <laughs> though it's couched in a much nicer way in Zorn's Lemma. It's a much nicer way to write, write, write up the basic idea. So what it turns out is that uh, every um, linearly, indie, okay, so then the definition, every uh, linearly independent set that generates X is called a basis. So a basis is, need not be unique. The basis need not be unique, but the cardinality of the basis is unique. And we're not going to prove that here. That's from the first question. In the finite dimensional case, that's done in linear algebra. In the infinite dimensional case, it's uh, somewhere else. I don't think this text even bothers with that. Okay, But infinity is infinity. So cardinality is a special thing, because you can talk about the cardinality of infinite numbers as being distinct, different infinities. So we won't go there. <laughs> that's where we stop it. But, uh, so that the smallest set M would be linearly independent, and so these things exist. Bases exist is uh, one of the propositions in the later section based on Zorn's Lemma. In the finite dimensional cases, it's proved in the linear algebra course. In the infinite dimensional case, it's proved in section 4.1 of this course using Zorn's Lemma. So we will get to Zorn's Lemma. It would be nice to cover that. Um, Okay, I think that's going to be it for today. Uh, the final question is about, let's see, let's go over what's going to be happening. Every week, I'm going to assign homework. And those are just simply problems from the text. Right now, I'm trying to cover three sections a week uh, because the sections are quite uh, short and, uh, and broken down in such a way that we can get through it. Um, and I'll assign roughly five or six problems. Sometimes a couple more. If I only cover two sections in the problems tend to be that way, I'll, I might go up to seven problems. And then I'll, sometimes I'll put an extra credit problem. So those will count um, as extra points. Maybe not, not maybe graded as full credit, you know, but in terms of they might have, if, if a regular problem is worth five points, an extra credit problem might be worth two or three points, depending on how hard it was. Um, that kind of a thing. Um, 
So homework due, homework one is due January, due January 26th. And that's uh, written out on your syllabus. It's, it's um, 2.1 number nine. Two point, excuse me, number nine and ten. Two point two, number nine and eleven, and two point three. I have assigned problems three and nine, and then seven is an extra credit problem. So that's an extra credit. So two point three number seven is extra credit. That's the understanding there. And there are, I do work out some of the problems in the notes, and I will continue to do that um, whether I type out the notes or not. Okay, in these notes. Though these notes that I'm writing on the screen are much cruder, obviously. <laughs> so I may continue to type, but I may put less effort, I don't know. Because <laughs> it takes a long time to type those. 40 pages of text into six pages of notes is like, oh. I'll do my best. To prepare. So, okay. So, when I find out about the web page and so on, what the actual address is for this stuff, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you.